Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, where they would receive and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus had ascended into heaven, the disciples returned to Jerusalem and waited for the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4 tells us, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was the time of Pentecost when the Jews from all nations were gathered in Jerusalem, hearing the disciples declaring the wondrous works of God in their own languages, where they were from, marveled at what was taking place, and Peter preached to them with power, declaring Jesus Christ as the resurrected Saviour. That day multitudes believed and were added to the church, and as the church grew, the Spirit of God moved with power through the believers. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a vital part in the growth and establishment of the Church of Jesus Christ. Nearly 2,000 years later, we pick up our story in Sunderland, the United Kingdom, where in 1907 at the All Saints Monk Wearmouth Hall, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that impacted the church and started a new move of God all around the world. There's no doubt that the beginning of the 20th century was a really significant time of spiritual awakening and renewal. You have the Welsh Revival, you have renewals happening in India, in America, and, uh, and then Pentecostalism will flow out of that. It's really not just about something happening in the 1900s, though. It goes back to the later part of the 19th century, where a number of things were going on socially and culturally. People were uncertain. They felt under pressure. They talked about the speed of change that was happening around them. And for a number of people at that time, a number of the, the Western population, certainly, there was a, a nervousness about what was going on in society. Do you think of 1859 Darwinism? He, he wrote his book, Skepticism was coming in. The German higher criticism was coming in, ripping apart the scriptures, denying the supernatural, denying the power of God. The church was under great danger across the world. It was going to kill the missionary spirit. It was going to kill that spirit of holiness, of reality, of the miraculous element of Christianity. And Christianity is supernatural. You can't make it natural. Out of that, one of the things that was happening was there was a, a prayer movement beginning where people would come together to pray for revival, to pray for spiritual experiences, to pray that they would grow in God. And I think when you put the two things together, the sort of the changes that were happening in society and the, the, the hunger, the spiritual hunger that was there in the sort of last 25 years of the 19th century, that you start to see the, the green shoots of spiritual renewal around the world. So what did God do? God stepped down into the nations. He shook nations. Wales, he brought Wales to its knees. All these revivals was God's answer to an atheistic age. And, you know, I believe God delivered the church and he raised up a great missionary revival that went out across this world. When we commenced our meetings here, we were well aware of the history of the hall. And so I felt very privileged and very humbled also at the fact that we were now in the birthplace of Pentecostalism in Great Britain. This was the only other place besides Azusa Street in Los Angeles where there had been such a mighty outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Alexander Body was the father of British Pentecostalism. From him and through his influence, he directly ministered to some of the leaders who would, uh, in a sense, take up the baton of Pentecostalism in Britain and would be the Pentecostal leaders for the next 30 years up to the Second World War. He was really seeking for something from God. He realised that his Christianity and his Christian experience lacked something 
he heard of a man called T.B. Barrett. T.B. Barrett is a Cornishman, but he was living in Norway. He was born originally in England. He moved as a young man to Norway. He was in the Methodist movement. His grandfather was a great Methodist preacher and leader. At a young stage, he was a young man, 17 years old. He began to preach, felt the call of God to preach the gospel. Eventually, he went to New York City and was at A.B. Simpson's uh, Bible College when he read the first magazine from Azusa Street talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street. When he heard that, you know, such a hunger came for that which the early disciples and apostles experienced in the upper room. He began to tarry and pray for this Pentecostal revival. The Holy Ghost fell on him and he got Pentecost. He started to pray for Europe, pray for Norway, pray that a revival would sweep these nations. When he came back from New York, went back to Oslo in December of 1906, a revival began. A.A. Body in Sunderland, he heard of that revival. Here is an insert of a letter from Thomas Barrett in Norway to the Azusa Street Revival in America. It says, God is wonderfully demonstrating his power here in the Norwegian capital. Many are seeking salvation and souls are being gloriously saved. Hundreds are seeking a clean heart and a fire is falling on the purified sacrifice. All can see it is the work of God's Holy Spirit. Yours in Christ Jesus, T.B. Barrett. A.A. Body, he went there to Norway and pleaded with Barrett. He preached in the revival there. He watched that move of God. A.A. Body got such a hunger. He said, we need this in Britain. We need a revival in our churches and our movements. He wanted to bring it to the Anglican Church in Britain. He pleaded with Barrett to come to Sunderland and to preach a convention. T.B. Barrett arrived in England when he arrived there, all he had was a tongue of fire. He was ablaze with the Spirit of God. Nobody knew him in Great Britain. But here came a man with a real baptism in the Holy Ghost. He was not able to preach in the Anglican Church because he was not an ordained Anglican minister. So they held some prayer meetings in the choir vestry. They started their meetings the 1st of September, just tarrying, seeking God in the small vestry of that church. They prayed, they looked to Christ, they looked for a move of God. A.A. Body's wife, she got the baptism, his daughters got filled with the Holy Ghost in such a beautiful way. And people began to receive baptism in the Holy Spirit with signs following, speaking in tongues. And so, to get over the canon law, they moved from the Anglican Church to hold public meetings here at All Saints Hall. This is the parish hall in Monk Wearmouth. And so people began to hear of the experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they came and they were baptised in the Holy Spirit. This was the beginning of a revival that was going to sweep these nations and raise up many great missionaries and leaders. T.B. Barrett began to preach in those meetings. Newspaper reporters came. So they knew something significant is happening here in these meetings. T.B. Barrett knew it. He said, all the eyes across Britain are upon this place called Sunderland. Newspapers carried reports of these people speaking in a strange language. You know, and reports went across the country. You have to remember that Pentecost uh, as a denomination was not yet formed. And it was people coming from Anglican churches, from Methodist churches, from Baptist churches. Uh, people who were hungry for God came and their lives were tremendously impacted. Some went back to their churches and were ostracized because uh, people didn't accept speaking in tongues uh, as a modern day experience. They wanted to confine it to the New Testament times. Alexander Body really was a, a, a gatherer of people and a gatherer of what God was already doing rather than a commissioner. And so it wasn't so much that he had, that Alexander Body had that, this idea that he would take over the country in a Pentecostal manner by planting out. He became a, a rallying point for them and delighted in the fact that Sunderland was a place where people would come from across the denominations. It was an Anglican church. And Alexander Body was an Anglican, remained so throughout all of his ministry. 
the first person to come to Smith Wigglesworth and tell him about this Pentecost revival had come to Sunderland was a man who was actually healed through his ministry. When Smith Wigglesworth told friends that he's going to Sunderland to these tongue speakers, well, everybody warned him against it. He said, if I go there and Christ isn't glorified, I won't stay there. So he sat in those meetings. He got to the end of his few days there. Before he left to go home, he went round to AA body and sister body was there and he started telling her, well, I'm going home now, but I don't have the Holy Ghost, haven't spoken in tongues, haven't received. And she says, well, come in. Can I lay hands on you and pray for you? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll let anyone pray for me for this baptism. She laid hands on him and then she was called out of the room. And as he sat in that room, the Spirit of God fell on him. He had an open vision of Jesus Christ exalted. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Do you know he sent a message back to his wife, to Polly, and he said, I've got it. I've got a Pentecostal baptism. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. She didn't like that. Now she's at home, received that message, and she says, I do have the Holy Ghost. He thinks he's got it. I've got it. Well, we'll see when he gets home, says when he gets home, he can preach. You know, I watched you. I know you. I know your weakness and your inability. Well, he got up that morning and he began to preach under the power of the Holy Ghost. She moved up and down that pew and she said, this is not my Smith. This is not the Smith I know. What has happened to him? She soon got the baptism as well. You see, when he received the power of the Holy Ghost, his tongue was loosed. From that day, he was able to preach the gospel with power and anointing. Men got saved, bodies got healed. They began to hold yearly conventions, which was always around the Whitsuntides, which celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit. They had yearly meetings where people came from all over the world. There were significant leaders there in those gatherings, men like Cecil Pulhill, who was going to be the future leader of the Pentecostal missionary movement. Others, Thomas Marskov, he led the first Pentecostal Bible school there in Preston, gathered young men, and he got the baptism in the Holy Ghost at Sunderland. W.F.P. Burton, he was a great missionary, raised up a thousand churches in Congo. He was sitting there in those meetings. You couldn't even name all the ones that were touched and deeply affected sitting in those meetings that were scattered to the ends of the earth. The significance of Sunderland was that it became a European center. So before the First World War broke, um, you have people from France, Holland and Germany in particular who were all experiencing similar things, coming together with the British to actually start to debate and discuss what's going on amongst them. And Body was really keen that not only would people experience more of the Holy Spirit, but that they would think through what's going on and, and make sure they're not going off at a tangent. One of the great things is that believers first heard of this baptism in the Holy Ghost, a real work, that what happened at Pentecost was still alive, still real, and still for the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, each of those conventions, it began a pattern that spread out across this land. Other similar conventions spread to London, up into Scotland, Northern Ireland. It was a pattern and example of what a Pentecostal convention ought to be and should be. And the life and the power, the gifts of the Holy Ghost operated in those meetings beautifully, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, the worship of God, where there was a break and forth of singing. People could come together. And many came to watch and look and query, is this real? Is this God? Is what happened in the book of Acts for today? And they found the answer to that at Sunderland. The magazine that came from Sunderland was fueled by the conferences and conventions that happened and became uh, a brilliant source of um, the stories of, of what God was doing in, in localities. Alexander Bolly gave the opportunity for this uh, brilliant coming together of what God was doing around the country. And people found confidence in that. His pastoral heart was unique. He was a very meek man, very gracious. Often we think of a strong character leading a revival. But he had such a beautiful graciousness, wasn't noted for his dynamic preaching. But he was a leader. He was a godly man. He was able to bring all these leaders together, hold them together for the first seven years of that revival. 
And there's no doubt God gifted him with that pastoral heart to bring these people together. Such a diversity. A man like Wigglesworth, it takes grace to work with such a strong character as well as others that were very quiet and timid. Men like Donald G and others. So he was able to bring all this together and he was able to keep this movement on track until other leaders were raised up and movements and denominations came out of that. He was able to take a back seat in many ways. His own magazine went out across the world, Confidence Magazine. He wrote it to call them together for the first Whitsuntide Convention. His magazine carried testimonies, messages by a host of those leaders that were raised up. One of the things that Alexander Body was brilliant at was unearthing stories of what God was doing around the place. One of the people who caught Alexander Body's eye was George Jeffries and, and his brother Stephen Jeffries. They were involved in some uh, revival meetings in, in South Wales particularly. News spread widely. A.A. Body up in Sunderland heard about it, come all the way down to Wales, said, I must speak to these brothers, I must speak to them. Stephen and George sat with A.A. Body at that time and they began to share their burden. The key burden they had was that in the Pentecostal revival, the great need was for Pentecostal evangelists. Through Confidence Bodies magazine, he would carry preached messages, some mighty messages by Stephen Jeffries. You can read them today. And then, 1912, 1913, George was invited up to Sunderland to, to preach at, um, uh, during the convention weeks. And from that, that gave him a platform for a much wider audience than he might have had in South Wales alone. And um, in those meetings were people from Ireland who heard George speak and invited him across to Ireland to talk to them about evangelism. Uh, the first meetings uh, seem to have happened in around 1914. Now, George Jeffries, he went to a small place called Monaghan, just over the border. He met with some believers. They were meant to hold a campaign But once it was heard that they were Pentecostals, tongue speakers, miracle workers, well, those Methodists who owned that building shut the door. He was praying, seeking God, saying, Oh God, what should I do? Many doors were opening up across Britain. But as he tarried and sought the will of God, God said, Ireland. And in an upper room in Monaghan, the Elam movement was birthed. And the motto that they birthed in that upper room was Ireland for Christ. That they would have a band of young evangelists who would go out across the land, pioneering, evangelizing, starting new churches. In Northern Ireland, it was phenomenal. Even during those war years, they, it was greatly restricted, yet they raised up churches in Lurgan, Portadown, Belfast, Ballymena, all the main centres. And again, a revival came to those communities. My great-grandmother was caught up in that. She used to get George Jeffrey's magazines, hide them under her seat. She was a Presbyterian but she knew there was a reality in this Pentecostal revival. That was the beginning of the work there in Ireland. But it began through the relationships that had been uh, formed by Alexander Body with the brothers directly, and then the opportunities that Alexander Body gave to George Jeffries to be heard by a much wider group of people than he otherwise might have had at that time. Born out of this hall were the Pentecostal denominations that we know today. That's the Assemblies of God, Healing Pentecostal, the Apostolic Church. And then there were also missionaries. The Pentecostal Missionary Union began here in Sunderland. At one of the early Sunderland conventions, one of the visitors to the convention was a man called Cecil Polehill. But he had been one of the Cambridge Seven. Now, in the 19th century, the late 19th century, the Cambridge Seven included people like C.T. Studd and the Paul Hill brothers. There were seven Cambridge graduates, some of whom were uh, sports people, but all of them well-known, who went to China and Tibet as missionaries. The impact it had would be like if David Beckham became a Christian and then became a, a missionary in some country in Africa. It would be front-page news. Cecil Polehill came to Sunderland because he had encountered Pentecostalism in America and had been received the baptism of the Spirit and spoke with Alexander Body and said, it's absolutely crucial that we equip people to become missionaries throughout the world. So together they established this uh, training school called the Pentecostal Missionary Union. They actually established two. They established one for men in Preston 
and one for women in London. People like George Jeffries went. People like Willie Burton, who became a great um, um, African missionary, significant leader. James Salter also was there. These schools had an ongoing impact out of all uh, proportion to their size. And, and Body and Pole Hill wanted to take this idea of missionary training far more seriously. And so they established this Pentecostal Missionary Union that would train people and that would become an overseeing body for the missionary activity. The revival that began at Sunderland, it was the centre of all these great men we know, Smith Wigglesworth, all these men being raised up suddenly of God to go out in dynamic ministries of healing, of salvation, of affecting towns and cities. But each one of them could mark a significant meeting with God at the Sunderland Revival. So it was a real gathering of key vessels that God was going to use down over the years to come. And it seems to have been through from that period that Smith Wigglesworth was beginning to be invited elsewhere to preach. He was also a keen supporter of the Sunderland Conventions and would be a regular speaker there and a regular contributor to the magazine. So his name was becoming uh, sort of fairly well known within that circle. Smith Wigglesworth visit to Sunderland when he received the baptism in the Holy Ghost revolutionised ministry. Now think about it, he couldn't stand in a pulpit and preach before. This was the beginning of his preaching ministry, his pulpit ministry, just straight after this experience. A local factory owner who was a Christian believer heard he'd received the baptism, heard about the Pentecostal revival. He said, you must come to my factory and preach. He went to that factory. The factory owner closed it down. Hundreds of workers, he brought them into those meetings three times a day. Wiggles were stood and preached. There was a revival in that factory. Smith Wigglesworth was one of the best travelled Pentecostals in that period. He was relentlessly uh, restless, going to the States on numerous occasions, to Australia, to New Zealand, to Europe. He was a remarkable maverick. He was, in many senses, a little strange. They would have an illness of cancer in the stomach. He would punch them in the stomach. Now, no evangelist up to that point ever done that. The American audience looked on as this evangelist punched someone with cancer in the stomach. One incident said a lady slapped him back, was offended with him, said, how dare a preacher punch me in the stomach? But you know, he was angry at that cancer. He could see that the devil was afflicting bodies and he was gonna fight back. That same lady come to the meeting the next evening with tears rolling down her face, said, I must testify. She stood up and said, God healed me of my cancer. I, I, I asked forgiveness of the man of God. I hit him. I didn't realize what he was doing. See, there was a bold faith. He assaulted illness. He wasn't playing games. He wasn't hoping. He demanded that those bodies were made well. I believe that Smith Wigglesworth probably affected America in a greater way as far as the Pentecostal revival than any other single man, maybe apart from Seymour at Azusa Street. He was asked to preach at camp meetings all across that nation. And in each one of those great campaigns, there was mighty miracles. We start to look at the lives of these early Pentecostals. We easily can fast forward to the glory days. In the case of Smith Wigglesworth, there were many years of being a plumber in Bradford. There were years of working with kids in Liverpool, which nobody would have said was glamorous. There were the years in a mission church in Bradford where life was not always easy and he had other strong characters in his church who in time would ask him to leave. There was the fact that his daughter was profoundly deaf and never healed. The fact that he suffered from kidney stones and would be preaching uh, in acute pain and because of his point of view, would not take medicine, and so would pass the kidney stones with an absolute agony. All of this is the hinterland of Smith Wigglesworth. There are churches in Australia that were birthed because of his ministry, and they're still operating now in Brisbane and in Melbourne. There are churches in New Zealand who would look back to his ministry in the 1920s and 30s as being the key moment where Pentecostalism really took off in their own country. Smith Wigglesworth 
as he began to travel out, went to the great nation of Australia. He went there. In those days, they traveled by boat. It was a long journey. Often, he would win men to the Lord. He would preach in those boats. He was a soul winner on that boat. He wasn't just going to hold a campaign. When he got to that continent, he was the main influence, really, in many ways. All the witnesses said to bring the Pentecost revival to Australia. There was a a great hardness against the message of Pentecost in the evangelical movements of that day, very resistant about it. They heard about these Pentecostals who spoke in tongues and done great miracles. They actually got a dumb man, a deaf and dumb man, and they said, we're going to have fun here. We know this deaf and dumb man. We've known him for many years. We're going to send him into that healing line. They thought this was funny. They thought this was a great laugh. We're going to make a fool of him. Well, they all went into that meeting, and when the altar call was come, they pushed him down there. They're all laughing, nudging each other. They push him down into that healing line. Well, do you know that deaf and dumb man was totally healed? The power of God come on him and he was healed. Those young men were dumbfounded and they repented. A revival broke out in that continent. These guys had given themselves to the work of God. They'd given themselves to the Pentecostal move of God. And it was almost like they they have their moment and they do what God asks of them and then they retreat into the shadows and everybody forgets them. And they certainly weren't in it to become superstars or to have plaques put on houses or on churches about them. They were simply doing what they felt God would want of them at any one time. When a group of believers seek God, they will find him because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When we encounter God, we are always richer for the experience. We cannot stand in the presence of God without being changed for good. As we heard about the experiences of those who sought God in this place and were changed for good, so we should continue to seek God no matter where we are because He is always with us, wanting to reveal Himself to us so that we might know Him and be changed. Joel 2 verse 28 and 29 tells us, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. Jesus encourages us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. He says, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. This scripture came alive in the life of an evangelist from Bradford, West Yorkshire, England. That man was Smith Wigglesworth. Only believe would be his life's motto. Smith Wigglesworth was born in 1859, the year of the great Ulster Revival in Northern Ireland where 100,000 people come to Christ. I, I always connect that because it was a significant year of revival. Smith Wigglesworth was born into a really poor situation in Bradford. In the early years, his father really struggled and it, it does seem that as a family they were just living below subsistence for most of the time. His grandmother had quite an impact on him and took him to a Methodist church, a Wesleyan Methodist church in Bradford. His grandmother was a firebrand. They called them primitive Methodists. They went back to that early Methodist revival led by John Wesley. They believed in the real fiery Holy Ghost, a real moving of the Holy Ghost to meetings. As a young boy, he sat in those meetings. They used to dance around that, that fire in the middle of the room. They would praise God. You know, he was raised in that environment. He was there, and as they danced, and his grandmother danced, um, just praising and worshipping God, He looked to the Lamb of God. You see, from the very beginning, that statement, only believe that become his whole life's motto, it was birthed in that room. 
and a vision that Jesus Christ died for him and he believed on him. He was born again that night, saved in an old primitive meeting. See where there's life, things do happen. A young life can be transformed. Smith Wiggles, in time, moved from working in the mill. He'd left school very early. Effectively, his education finished, his full-time education finished when he was eight years old. So he actually was operating in a semi-literate state, at, at least. He'd become a plumber. At his workplace, he worked with an old Plymouth brethren. Believer who'd go out in the streets was a man of the word of God and prayer. And you, as they worked together, and he was teaching young Wigglesworth his trade, you know, he told him about the soon coming of Jesus Christ, that Christ was coming, coming soon, that he needed to be ready. And you, that message, he picked it up and it burnt in his life, that he must make ready the church for the coming of Jesus again. The family, as they sort of improved themselves in, in social statuses, seems to have moved across to uh, the Anglican church. And when Smith Wigglesworth was 12 years old, he was confirmed into the Anglican church. And the bishop came down and prayed for him. And in later years, he would say that at that moment, he was filled with the Spirit. That he had an experience of the Spirit then that would be matched by, that would, in a sense, remind him about what happened in Sunderland sort of 40 years later. But when he was 12, that experience of being filled with the Spirit as the bishop laid his hands on him. And in time, uh, working with some of his uh, uh, colleagues, associates in the plumbing trade, he got in touch with the Salvation Army. There in Bradford, his hometown, the Salvation Army come. This was a whole new realm to him, took him to a whole new phase. When they come, they evangelize with fire and brimstone in the streets. They preached a, a gospel of the blood of redemption that could save men. And you know, he joined himself to them. They, they were evangelists. They were a movement on fire. You know, he would pray through the night with them. They, they would lie on their faces. The power of God would descend and they would go out and evangelize under great persecution. He caught that fire for evangelism, for soul winning. And again, the Salvation Army in that period were, were really quite the charismatics of their age. They were uh, very expressive in their, in their worship, very uh, joyous, very outgoing, exuberant, and very, of course, very mission-minded. And this seems to have suited Smith Wigglesworth to the ground. He moved from Bradford to Liverpool when he was in his early 20s. And whilst he was there, got engaged in working with young people and children, particularly of the, of the poorest of the poor. He laboured there in Liverpool, just labouring with souls, winning hundreds to Christ. But he did have a passion and a burden for souls. He'd speak to people on street corners. He'd go sit by their beds in the hospital. He would tell them of Christ, share the gospel with them. That's where he really dealt with souls, learned how to plead with someone, turn them to Christ. Hands were laid upon him once. He would always break into tears when he testified. But some of those old holy men of God come and laid hands on him and prayed for him. Ever after that, he could stand in a meeting and testify. He would plead with men. He was like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He was a man of real passion, but he still couldn't preach. He still had love for souls, could testify. So that was how God prepared him. When he's 23, he moves back to Bradford. And it's at that time that he meets his wife, Polly, a Salvation Army officer in the local corps. And, and that relationship was going to be the crucial relationship for Smith Wigglesworth for the next period of time. You know, if you were a helper with the Salvation Army, you couldn't have a relationship with an officer, so that caused a problem. But she was a firebrand. She was a soul winner, very able, went off preaching across the country. He couldn't do that, but he could evangelize one-to-one. -one. He won her heart, asked her to marry him, called her Polly, always called her Polly, and he did marry her. And, you know, they settled there in Bradford. Now, he started his own plumbing business, he was very good at his job, very successful, very able. But, you know, a bad winter came whenever there was lots of burst pipes. He'd become very busy with that business. Little time to read, little time to pray, little time to get alone with God. He was just constant around the clock. The demands of that workplace become greater than the demands to be alone with God. We're told that his heart began to harden, really against God. Didn't have time for meetings didn't have time to be with the people of God. And, you know, there was a clash between him and his wife, Polly. The colder he got, the brighter she burnt. She just began to blaze. 
She didn't get on his back. She just kept praying, believing God and burnt as a testimony. God melted his heart. He repented. He broke. He asked God to forgive him. And you know, from that day, every work job he was on, he's fixing those pipes. He's witnessing. He's evangelizing, winning men and women to God. Again, working with his hands, but called to win men to Jesus Christ. From early days, Smith Wigglesworth was absolutely convinced that Jesus was still in the healing business. He'd experienced it himself when he was healed of appendicitis. He'd experienced it when he'd been praying for people in local church context. This is long before the Pentecostal message as such had, uh, had, had been, people were aware of. It was just for Smith and Wigglesworth almost uh, a logical outflow of the fact that if Jesus has risen from the dead, then he's still doing the same works he was involved with during his days on earth. There was meetings held in Leeds in the north of England and he went along to those meetings and just simple gatherings of believers but they were bold in faith and as he watched he was astounded that the sick bodies were healed. He watched and beheld just like what he read of in the ministry of Jesus Christ the sick being healed. He beheld this. This had a deep impact that would revolutionize his ministry down over the years and would be a significant part of it. And as he was in those meetings he would get involved he would go home, he would uh, fill a truck with people of, with sick bodies. He would say, come here concerning a man who heals sick bodies. He'd bring them in there, they'd get healed, saved, changed. So he filled those meetings, he brought lots of people there. He was invited to, to look after this group while the leaders were away. He did it with much fear and trepidation. And of course he couldn't preach at that stage. He said, well, I'm no preacher. He said, well, just read some of the scripture and, and pray for the sick. Now he's well out of his depths. Do you know into that meeting came real people with real sicknesses? As he looked upon them, that compassion of Jesus Christ rose up in his heart. He went, these people haven't come to be prayed for. They've come to be healed by the master. He made an altar call for the sick and they come out. He went to the first man, which is a Scotsman who was lame. He laid hands on him. That Scotsman got to shouting, got to dancing, totally healed by the power of God. That single miracle revolutionized his ministry. Him and his wife started meetings in Bradford. They not only made a, a stand for holiness, but they made a stand for healing. Christ as a healer still heals the sick today. They start having their own healing meetings in Bradford. They brought many in, many sick bodies uh, would be healed in that small building. You know, it was miraculous what God done there. But God started to prepare him in that small building for a miraculous ministry that would carry him across this world. But it all started with the compassion of Jesus Christ. His heart was moved for the sick and God threw him out onto the, that miraculous ministry because he was faithful to even get sick people to a meeting. He had many experiences with God, with the Holy Ghost, but what he seen in the book of Acts, he did not have. He just longed for more. He wanted a real Pentecostal experience, but he knew that he didn't have that. He knew he had a touch of God in his life. He knew God was using him, but he didn't have that baptism that Peter had, that Paul had, that John had, and he did want it. One of the things that was different, of course, with the Pentecostal movement was that people spoke in tongues. And that was the defining difference between Pentecostalism and the holiness movement, for example. They, they completely agreed on much of everything else, but tongues was the difference. The first person to come to Smith Wigglesworth and tell him about this Pentecostal revival had come to Sunderland was a man who was actually healed through his ministry. When Smith Wigglesworth told friends that he's going to Sunderland to these tongue speakers, well, everybody warned him against it. He said, if I go there and Christ isn't glorified, I won't stay there. So he sat in those meetings. He got to the end of his few days there. Before he left to go home, he went round to AA body and sister body was there and he started telling her, well, I'm going home now, but I don't have the Holy Ghost. Haven't spoken in tongues, haven't received. And she says, well, come in. Can I lay hands on you and pray for you? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll let anyone pray for me for this baptism. She laid hands on him and then she was called out of the room. And as he sat in that room, the spirit of God fell on him. He had an open vision of Jesus Christ exalted. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Do you know he sent a message back to his wife 
to Polly and he said, I've got it. I've got a Pentecostal baptism. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. She didn't like that. Now, she's at home, received that message, and she says, I do have the Holy Ghost. He thinks he's got it. I've got it. Well, we'll see when he gets home, says, when he gets home, he can preach. You know, I watched you. I know you. I know your weakness and your inability. Well, he got up that morning and he began to preach under the power of the Holy Ghost. She moved up and down that pew and she said, this is not my Smith. This is not the Smith I know. What has happened to him? She soon got the baptism as well. You see, when he received the power of the Holy Ghost, his tongue was loosed. From that day, he was able to preach the gospel with power and anointing. Men got saved, bodies got healed. And from that day, there was a shift, in a sense, in the ministry patterns. It now wasn't Polly, who was the full-time minister, as it were, but now it was much more uh, a partnership. And, of course, in time, it would become the other way, where Polly would become supportive of Smith's ministry. Smith Wigglesworth's visit to Sunderland when he received the baptism in the Holy Ghost revolutionized ministry. Now think about it, he couldn't stand in a pulpit and preach before. This was the beginning of his preaching ministry, his pulpit ministry. Just straight after this experience, a local factory owner who was a Christian believer heard he'd received the baptism, heard about the Pentecostal revival. He said, you must come to my factory and preach. He went to that factory the factory owner closed it down. Hundreds of workers, he brought them into those meetings. Three times a day, Wiggles were stood and preached. There was a revival in that factory. First things that uh, Smith Wigglesworth was involved with after his experience in Sunderland was uh, establishing uh, a church in, in, in Bradford. And um, as with many of the churches at that time, they would do Easter conventions where other ministers would be invited to preach. And that had a, a kind of a dual effect. It meant that uh, there was a, a cross-fertilization of ideas, but it also meant that you were able to hear people that you hadn't heard before, and so invitations would be extended. And it seems to have been through from that period that Smith Wigglesworth was beginning to be invited elsewhere to preach. Now, from this time, him and his wife, they traveled out across Britain. They spread the message of Pentecost that they first heard in Sunderland, out into Scotland, out across the north of England, down into the south of England. Him and his wife travelled together for a few short years. 1913, his wife died. When she died, that was a heartbreaking time for him. You know, he wasn't a callous man. It says that he wept. He almost felt like he wanted to die when she died. He was a man of faith, but he was a man of real feelings and thoughts. And, you know, just after that, he prayed. He said, oh, God, open up a door for me that I'm not... I'm not distracted by that I want to serve you and it was just then 1914 he received the first invitation to go to America this is just the months the six months leading into the world war so he got that invitation the beginning of 1914. Smith Wigglesworth was one of the best traveled Pentecostals in that period he was relentlessly uh, restless going to the states on numerous occasions to Australia to New Zealand to Europe he was a remarkable maverick. He was, in many senses, a little strange. They would have an illness of cancer in the stomach. He would punch them in the stomach. The no evangelist up to that point ever done that. The American audience looked on as this evangelist punched someone with cancer in the stomach. One incident said a lady slapped him back, was offended with him, said, how dare a preacher punch me in the stomach? But you know, he was angry at that cancer. He could see that the devil was afflicting bodies and he was going to fight back. That same lady come to the meeting the next evening with tears rolling down her face said, I must testify. She stood up and said, God healed me of my cancer. I, I, I asked forgiveness of the man of God. I hit him. I didn't realize what he was doing. See, there was a bold faith. He assaulted illness. He wasn't playing games. He wasn't hoping. He demanded that those bodies were made well people would come and stand there literally with blind eyes this wasn't behind a curtain this in public meetings and he would say I know when I lay hands on you you will see he would lay hands on them and those blind eyes would open that happened many times there was many witnesses that blind eyes were open just one incident that I can remember reading from his writings was that there was one child brought without even eye sockets 
there in the head and, and miraculously God moved and created eyes within it. That's not possible humanly. You know, he would stand there laying hands on them. Legs would be straightened, healed. I believe that Smith Wigglesworth probably affected America in a greater way as far as the Pentecostal revival than any other single man, maybe apart from Seymour at Azusa Street. He was asked to preach at camp meetings all across that nation. And that was the beginning of a very significant influence on the whole church movement there in America. Many were encouraged to step out in faith. We start to look at the lives of these early Pentecostals. We easily can fast forward to the glory days. In the case of Smith Wigglesworth, there were many years of being a plumber in Bradford. There were years of working with kids in Liverpool, which nobody would have said was glamorous. There were the years in a mission church in Bradford where life was not always easy and he had other strong characters in his church who in time would ask him to leave. There was the fact that his daughter was profoundly deaf and never healed. The fact that he suffered from kidney stones and would be preaching uh, in acute pain and because of his point of view would not take medicine and so would pass the kidney stones with an absolute agony. All of this is the hinterland of Smith Wigglesworth. There are churches in Australia that were birthed because of his ministry and they're still operating now in Brisbane and in Melbourne. There are churches in New Zealand who would look back to his ministry in the 1920s and 30s as being the key moment where Pentecostalism really took off in their own country. Smith Wigglesworth, as he began to travel out, went to the great nation of Australia. He went there. In those days, they traveled by boat. It was a long journey. Often, he would win men to the Lord. He would preach in those boats. He was a soul winner on that boat. He wasn't just going to hold a campaign. When he got to that continent, he was the main influence, really, in many ways. All the witnesses said to bring the Pentecost revival to Australia. There was a, a great hardness against the message of Pentecost in the evangelical movements of that day, very resistant about it. They heard about these Pentecostals who spoke in tongues and done great miracles. They actually got a dumb man, a deaf and dumb man, and they said, we're going to have fun here. We know this deaf and dumb man. We've known him for many years. We're going to send him into that healing line. They thought this was funny. They thought this was a great laugh. We're going to make a fool of him. Well, they all went into that meeting. And when the altar call was come, they pushed him down there. They're all laughing, nudging each other. They pushed him down into that healing line. Well, do you know that deaf and dumb man was totally healed? The power of God come on him and he was healed. Those young men were dumbfounded and they repented. A revival broke out in that continent. He was asked to come to New Zealand. Moody had been there. Uh, R.A. Torrey had been there, held great evangelistic campaigns. But when Smith Wigglesworth went there, it was a greater revival than Moody or Torrey had seen. The souls that got saved, more souls saved. He wasn't just a miracle worker. Souls came in. He worked miracles all right. But there was a supernatural power in those meetings that convinced souls. That's why he won more souls than Moody and Tory as he went out across these continents. And there in New Zealand, it was the greatest revival New Zealand had ever had. These nations, New Zealand and Australia, were deeply impacted. South Africa, other nations were deeply impacted. Nations, not just a town, not even just a city, but nations. And he left the harvest of souls behind him who became the leaders of the future generation. One of the stories about Smith Wigglesworth lives with me is a story that Lester Sumrall talks about himself. Now, Lester Sumrall, he was an American Pentecostal leader, quite a figure in the American post-war scene. Just around the war period, he was in Britain, working in Britain. And he tells a story about how he made his way to Bradford. Um, and Smith Wigglesworth was quite elderly. But Lester Sumrall used to go and visit him regularly. And Smith Wigglesworth would simply each time say, let's read the scriptures together and then let's pray. But the way the story is told is just the idea that here's an old Christian leader who's, who's 
wanting to introduce a young Christian who in time will be a leader, but not at that time, but who just wants to disciple someone and does it the best way he knows, which is actually read the scripture and pray. And Lester Summerall talks about how the idea that one day he turned up to his door um, with his bowler hat and his umbrella and a newspaper under his arm. And Smith Wigglesworth took the newspaper from under his arm, threw it in the bush and said, you won't be needing that. And invited him in and starts to train him. Now he does it in his own inimitable style. But those stories are the stories that are the unseen stories. They're not about preaching to thousands. It's about the investment of time in one person. I think one of the lessons you can take from Smith Wigglesworth's life is that God uses eccentric people. Um, That he doesn't use just people who are nicely polished and socially acceptable, but he takes working class people from West Yorkshire with a strong accent that will never leave him Um, with methodologies that are very strange. Um, But he does use them for his glory. I think it's safe to say that he was, um, in many ways, a man with a single message about the significance and the necessity of having faith in Jesus who would meet you directly and um, make a real difference in your own life now. That, That was his key message wherever he preached. And secondly, his methodology, which was not copied, was not transferred to anybody else. But with that came a colourful nature of the the Pentecostal evangelist. I think there's more than one lesson that we can learn from Smith Wigglesworth's life. I think everybody would consider the miraculous element, the supernatural element, not just a preaching or a teaching ministry, but a miraculous element element and I think we're all very conscious of that you can't read his life without knowing that but also to learn concerning that bold faith you know there was a real bold faith that overcome opposition the natural thinking of man the unbelief the lies of the devil he he triumphed over that in a very real way he overcome and as a result of that multitudes of lives nations were affected through his life but you know I'd still go further I don't even believe those are the greatest lessons he was a man of the word of God you don't often hear that he was a man of holiness he wouldn't let newspapers in his door he he said don't be bringing that information from the world in here he was a man who would sit at the table if you spoke about natural things he said I don't want to hear that I want to talk about the Lord so you know he, he was a man he was a holy man he was a separated man he didn't have time for other things these are all things we must learn that he had a miraculous ministry because he was a holy man he was a man of prayer he was an evangelist a soul winner and I believe the greatest thing that we can learn from his life is that he was a soul winner he cared more about the soul of men than he did about the bodies of men of course we know he cared about the bodies of men he he had a tremendous healing ministry but he cared about the soul of man to heal a body and then still go to hell it, it was void, it was pointless. But he believed in being a soul winner. He, he witnessed to men in mines under the ground. He witnessed to them on hilltops, in factories, everywhere he went, on board boats and trains. He was a witness, he was an evangelist, he was a man out to take men to heaven. And I personally, I believe that that is the greatest mark of Smith Wigglesworth's ministry. And I believe the healings, the miracles, the signs, the wonders were just confirmation to the gospel message to bring sinners to Jesus Christ. His ministry was profound on a a global scale. He was gruff. He was direct. He was, in some ways, quite uh, straightforward and, and almost simplistic. But the effect of that ministry had an impact much wider than anybody might have guessed in Bradford when he was establishing his own mission hall. And I think it's for those sort of reasons we ought to honour some of Wigglesworth's legacy as, uh, as we look back on, on his life and work.
Jesus tells his disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 35, Do you not say, Four months more than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Two brothers from a mining family would emerge from a mining town in South Wales. We brought in a harvest of souls and helped establish the British Pentecostal movement in the 20th century. Stephen Jeffries and George Jeffries opened their eyes and saw that the fields were ripe for harvest. George Jeffries came from a very working class family in South Wales, in Maesteg. His brothers and his father were all miners. But as a young boy, he was, he was actually quite a good deal frailer than his siblings. So he got a job in, in time working for the co-op as an errand boy, uh, rather than going down the mines. He became a Christian in the 1904 revival. Um, the church he was attending, the minister had been very affected by the, the preaching of the revival and was uh, clearly leading his own church in a way that was spiritually expectant and was uh, believing that God would want to do this work of revival in a very local church. And uh, George Jeffries, as a young boy, was listening to this preacher uh, preaching and gave his life to the Lord in November 1904, the same day as his brother, much older brother, Stephen Jeffries. And these two brothers, in time, would become key British Pentecostal leaders. But it began in a very poor background, in a very ordinary church, with a minister who dared to believe that what he'd seen happening through the revivalists and the work of people like Evan Roberts could actually happen in his own local church. Now, when you go back and see Stephen Jeffries before he was born again, you see him down in those mines. Those Welsh mines were a rough place. If you ever see a picture of him, he's a stocky build. He had a tremendous humour. You know, his brother George was quite a mild, calmer, quieter guy. But Stephen Jeffries wasn't like that. He, he was quite a bold, humorous. He was the centre of every gathering. But as an unsaved man, he worked down in those mines. It was a rough, violent and a wild place. But you know, again, he had his meeting with God in that 1904 revival. Continuing to be a miner for the next uh, eight or nine years, Stephen began to, to preach in chapels and holiness halls and little evangelistic missions up and down the Welsh Valleys. He would stand on a street corner. He would actually take a seat out and stand in his community. People would gather out their homes. Time after time he would preach until it would grow dark while he preached in the street corner. Men and women out of those mines would stand weeping and crying their way to Christ. This is where God trained him. George, in later days, would, would talk about being a 15-year-old and preaching in the open air the minister being beside him and coaching him and mentoring him. So from that young age, he's growing in both his calling and his, his, his sense of wanting to be able to proclaim the, the good news of Jesus in a public setting. George Jeffries and Stephen Jeffries had both become Christians on the same day uh, in 1904. And both um, from those days were, were absolutely convinced that this... Uh, talk of tongue speaking and the experience of the Spirit were not uh, appropriate or relevant or even accurate. You know, they weren't truthful. Um, but what seems to have happened is that Stephen's son went away on a, a kind of a, um, a special Bible weekend uh, in, in South Wales, away from home. And during that time, he came across a bunch of uh, early Pentecostals who prayed for him and he spoke in tongues. Now the story goes that, that Edward was only a, a young boy, sort of 10, 12 years old, that sort of age. He wasn't at all old. But when he came back, he talked to his father and to his uncle, George, about what had happened. And they began to be impressed by what they saw and persuaded by what they heard. And they, were, in turn, were filled with the Spirit. That led to both uh, George and Stephen identifying themselves with Pentecostals who were around the region and their experiences continued to grow and develop. But it's actually through the work of that young child, Edward, uh, the son, um, uh, that they actually came into the experience of the baptism of the Spirit. George Jeffries wanted to preach, wanted to serve God, had a great desire even to go to the mission field. He went to a Bible school in the north of England in Preston. 
that was run by Thomas Marskoff. He sat under the man of God, heard the word, George Jeffries. In there, he met key leaders that he was going to work with for the next 30 years. Now, only two months into his training, a revival broke out um, down here in Wales through his brother's ministry that was so astounding that he had to leave Bible school and come back here to Wales. Stephen Jeffries felt the call of God to step out, to go forth into other communities and towns. A call come to him to go preach in a small town community near the city of Swansea. He come to that first church and he began to preach. In that short mission of two weeks, he's seen over 150 souls born again. The Spirit of God began to fall. I'm tired, there was a wave of revival. Do you know the local newspapers began to call him a second Evan Roberts? They said, this must be another wave of the Welsh revival. Many sat in that meeting and said, this is the beginning of another Welsh revival. So great was that ministry. That's when George Jeffries got called out of Bible college to come and help him. He was preaching day and night, laboring, and he began to pray for the sick in those meetings for the first time. He'd heard that Christ was a healer, but him and George went to a home that prayed for a lady who was miraculously healed. She come and played the piano in all those meetings and testified in the in, in the evening meetings. And this was the beginning of him beginning to see that Christ is not only a savior, but he's a healer. News spread widely. A.A. Body up in Sunderland heard about it, come all the way down to Wales. He said, I must speak to these brothers. I must speak to them. Stephen and George sat with A.A. Body at that time and they began to share their burden. The key burden they had was that in the Pentecostal revival, the great need was for Pentecostal evangelists. And then 1912, 1913, George was invited up to Sunderland to, to preach at, um, uh, during the convention weeks. And from that, that gave him a platform for a much wider audience than he might have had in South Wales alone. And um, in those meetings were people from Ireland who heard George speak and invited him across to Ireland to talk to them about evangelism. Uh, the first meetings uh, seem to have happened in around 1914. Now George Jeffries, he went to a small place called Monaghan, just over the border. He met with some believers. They were meant to hold a campaign but once it was heard that they were Pentecostals, tongue speakers, miracle workers, well, those Methodists who owned that building shut the door. He was praying, seeking God, saying, oh God, what should I do? Many doors were opening up across Britain. But as he tarried and sought the will of God, God said, Ireland. And in an upper room in Monaghan, the Elam movement was birthed. And the motto that they birthed in that upper room was Ireland for Christ that they would have a band of young evangelists who would go out across the land, pioneering, evangelizing, starting new churches. In Northern Ireland, it was phenomenal. Even during those war years, they, it was greatly restricted, yet they raised up churches in Lurgan, Portadown, Belfast, Ballymena, all the main centres. And again, a revival came to those communities. My great-grandmother was caught up in that. She used to get George Jeffrey's magazines, hide them under her seat. She was a Presbyterian, but she knew there was a reality in this Pentecostal revival. That was the beginning of the work there in Ireland. Stephen experienced far more signs and wonders, probably than any of the Pentecostal leaders. It's just that they were often in obscure places or they weren't written up so well or they weren't preserved for posterity. One of the key events that happened around him, which is kind of a fascinating and um, strange phenomenon, was when he was preaching in a church in South Wales called Island Place, or Clinethley. And as he's preaching, um, people get a vision of a lamb on the wall behind him. And as they're looking at this vision of a lamb, it transforms into the face of Jesus. Now, the people at the time say that that image on the wall lasted for six hours. Certainly it was reported in the newspapers of the day, and Stephen would explain it as being the picture of a suffering servant. The vision happened one month before the outbreak of the First World War. And in the light of everything that happened, in that horrendous conflict. Stephen believed that what the vision referred to was the suffering that Jesus was engaged with. 
there weren't, this didn't happen again and again by any means. But it's an interesting example of one phenomena that surrounded his ministry and the way he interpreted it in terms of the bigger global issues that were going on around his own time. Stephen Jeffries was dynamic. He would preach like one of those old prophets. He would preach and deal with sin and many would get saved and God would confirm with miracles and signs and wonders following. One testimony of a little girl was standing in the line going into one of his meetings. She did not have eyeballs in her head. She just had empty sockets. There was a traditional local minister standing in the line with her. He looked at her and he actually asked himself, I wonder why she's going to the meeting. What is she going to get prayer for? Never thought that a little girl like that would go in and get prayer to be able to see. You know, at the end of that meeting, an altar call was called and she went up on that altar. That minister, that denominational minister sat on the platform and was looking at her as Stephen Jeffries laid his hands upon her. When he finished praying for her, she had two brand new eyes. She could see, she could look around her. Now this minister was shocked and astounded with that. He would go into hard places, but he would see one miracle, and from there, people would come from all across that city. You know, out of that small beginning in Northern Ireland, George Jeffries planted the first church in Belfast, and Hunter Street, and this grew beyond all bounds of imagination. By the end of the war, calls were coming from all across Britain to come plant churches. This whole group of young evangelists to bring this fire, this soul winning fire, and to raise up real New Testament churches, that was the real cry. That burden cry from across Britain, Scotland, England, and Wales got so strong that he moved his headquarters um, in the 20s over into London. He started a Bible school there, made that his headquarters and began to move out across Britain. Over the next decade, it grew beyond all bounds of imagination. He started an annual convention um, there in London. Great crowds would gather in, many souls would be saved. And at the end of that convention, they'd have the Lord's Supper. Do you know there's conventions recorded of in Glasgow and Scotland um, in the various cities of Birmingham and London and England, even here in Wales and Northern Ireland, where 10,000 people would gather in these places. Many of these people were saved through his ministry and the fruit of the preachers that he'd sent out across the nation. He would often go into an area, begin with 60 people in a meeting, and end up packing the biggest halls. George Jeffries was the most successful, the most prolific in, the, in, in that sense, the greatest British evangelist of the 20th century and is almost completely unknown. At the height of his evangelistic ministry, which was probably between the, the years 20, 1924 and 1934, so, but particularly if we, we think of one of those years in 1930, he did a, a, a series of meetings every night uh, over a six-week period in Birmingham. And it concluded, those meetings concluded with him preaching to 10,000 people every night. And over that period, about 30 churches were birthed. The meetings that he held were often huge meetings. He filled the Albert Hall every Easter Monday, time and time again. He was on the front pages of national newspapers and and. and these reporters would syndicate their stories, and so they would go around the world. And um, George was very aware of how, um, in a sense, that if you start with the cities and you start with the big towns, then you might actually be able to uh, affect a whole nation. The centrality of George Jeffrey's message was uh, made up of what he would call the four-square gospel, and um, used that imagery of the sort of the four foundation stones around which anyone's life would be built and certainly churches would be and the four square gospel was that Jesus was the saviour who came to bring new creation to people he was the baptizer in water but also in, in the particularly what he was talking about was the baptism in the Holy Spirit this empowering for mission and for living well he was the healer of, of one's body and uh, much of his ministry was engaged with the work of healing and he was the coming king. So whenever he was preaching, he would 
want to direct people to a saving faith in Jesus, but also a faith in Jesus that Jesus would still work the miracles of his day. And he took real care about how he was engaged in this ministry. Um, Many people were attracted by this ministry for obvious reasons. It was pre-National Health Service days. Unless you could afford to pay for medical health, things would be fairly grim. And so it attracted poorer people, it attracted desperate people, but every meeting that he was involved with would close with him offering prayer for the sick. One of the things he would do, though, is that when people were healed, he would have a team of people who would um, take the address of someone and often would take photographs of people. And um, over the years, uh, George Jeffries published a number of books and pamphlets, but, but books as well, where, in effect, he had before and after pictures, along with the, address, the name and address of the person. And I think one of the things that he was trying to do at that time was engage himself in authentic spiritual ministry. In other words, anybody could go and contact that person and say, is it true? These were specific miracles that were easily able to be validated or not. And I think I admire that in him, that he wasn't merely saying, you know, 500 people were healed of cancer, but he was telling them the name of someone who was healed of cancer, taking pictures of them so that their testimony would continue in the local communities. But it would also give a validation to the gospel message. And so the, 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 uh, the, the meetings and the crusades that he was involved with would be long-term affairs. So the, the meetings were large, they were well-known, they were well-publicized, and healing played a significant part in terms of waving the flag for the validation of the gospel. Stephen Jeffries had a very early impact on the Elam movement within Britain. He actually pastored their first Elam church ever in Wales. After Northern Ireland and the Elam movement being there, the first Elam church was in a place called Dowlas, just above Merthyr Tydfil in Wales. Now he went there, he left his first church and he went there to do campaigns and then was called as their pastor. I've actually seen pictures of him in that church with his elders and with crutches, everything hanging on the walls, all manners of of things to aid the sick, but people who had been healed, and they left all their instruments of illness in that building. I've seen those pictures, you see it all over the walls. See, it was a real New Testament ministry of an evangelist. He went there to Dallas, and he raised up the first Elam church. It was the first in the British Isles. From there, he worked with the Elam movement. His brother asked him to join him, Um, to join with them. Often they worked together in campaigns. They had preached side by side, laboured together to break in on towns and communities. But not too long into the 20s, he left Elam and he actually went as the main evangelist for the Assemblies of God in the British Isles. I I would actually say he, he was the great influence in establishing the Assemblies of God churches across the British Isles. It was a a small work. It was an initial beginning work. There was various ministries, but he was the evangelist who went into hard areas, pioneered, seen souls saved, and left those churches for other men to pastor. He, He was the evangelist above maybe any of those ministries, dynamic like a whirlwind. The meetings we know most about with Stephen were in the 20s and 30s. There are one or two books that were written about him during that time and they point to the miracles that were just kind of, if I say commonplace, it's not that they weren't valued, but it was just sort of expected as part of his ongoing ministry. And of course, in the same way as the other leaders, once people had been healed and that attracted bigger crowds and so particularly in places like London and East Barking, that sort of place, he was an out and out evangelist. His Welshness was very pronounced. People talked about how he would sometimes go off into um, what some people would call, speaking in tongues, other people would call the Welsh hoyle, this idea of just this outburst of exuberant praise or to God. Um, and so kind of never fitted into the, uh, the mould of an organised revival campaign. Uh, it was much more freewheeling than that was much more uh, emotional than that in many ways. 
In comparison to his brother George, George was very measured. George was not wild. He wasn't extreme. He was, you know, if you, there are recordings of George. And actually, if you listen to him, people say, he sounds a bit boring, didn't he? Whereas Stephen was much more expressive, much more, um, uh, yeah, sort of full of uh, the passion than perhaps George was. And where he went and where he ministered, he often ministered very powerfully. Because of his um, passion, because of his, for want of a better word, his Welshness, coming from this very south uh, Wales Valley culture, when he came out of that environment, I think people were a little in awe of him. And there had been the miracles around him, the sense that the, the raw, untamed power of God And this wasn't packaged neatly. You certainly couldn't tame Stephen. Nobody could. And he was his own man and would continue to be so throughout his life. One of the things about George Jeffries which is um, really interesting is that he actually probably never knew any situation except one of revival. He was born... Uh, spiritually born again in revival. He lived through the Welsh revival. He, his early experience of church post the Welsh revival was in small groups, what they call the children of the revival, home groups, that sort of thing. And then quickly went into a, a revival um, ministry where wherever he went, he only saw growth and revival happening around him. The brilliant thing about this was that he was absolutely convinced that this is how God wanted to use him. The difficult thing about that was he found it very difficult to understand how, what it was like for other people, perhaps ordinary church leaders who were embedded in a church for seven, eight years, who didn't live in continual revival. And I think in one sense it explains why some of the tensions happen between George Jeffries and the rest of his church leaders because his life really was quite different. He was also single all his life and therefore was able to be quite focused and single-minded. I think the other thing about George Jeffries is that he was in many ways uh, similar to many early Pentecostals. He was a maverick. He could be... Um, absolutely brilliantly used by God and then sometimes remarkably irrational and knee-jerk reacting to situations around him. I think at times he was quite difficult to work with um, because he was high-octane energy and yet when he was in relationship with people who could provide the administrative support around him and provide the consolidation, God sought to use him so well. Probably George Jeffrey's greatest contribution to the Pentecostal movement was to remind Pentecostal believers that evangelism was at the heart of the baptism of the Spirit. That it wasn't just so that people would have this kind of exotic spiritual experience, but actually it, the Spirit is the Spirit of mission, and it's the Spirit who uh, compels us to love our neighbour so that we might proclaim the good news of Jesus to them. I think in his ministry and the way he set his churches up, he placed that absolutely at the centre of their self-understanding. And you still see the traces of the DNA that actually Pentecostalism is linked to mission. And I think for uh, Elim and for the wider British Pentecostal movement, that's one of the gifts that George Jeffries gave us and uh, enabled us to live with. George Jeffries was a dynamic evangelist. They called him the principal because of raising up a Bible college. It was an apostolic ministry. He didn't see just souls saved. He gathered those lives together like John Wesley. That John Wesley was his great example. He gathered those flocks together after a campaign, leave New Testament churches with new leaders. It was a dynamic revival ministry. He brought revival to communities. He was able to break in upon cities and even upon these nations. Today we still see the fruit of Pentecostal churches in all of these lands. I can't hardly go to a town where there isn't the fruit of George Jeffrey's ministry. In Wales, 
in Scotland, in England, in Northern Ireland, every town I go to almost has something of the fruit of George Jeffries. That, that is phenomenal. When you think all these years later that still the churches are there, people preaching the gospel, people who remember that ministry, it still has remained the whole movement that still exists to this day.